Hi, I'm Dr. Hillary Eumanns. I'm speaking on acquired flat foot tibialis posterior and spring ligament, what the surgeon wants to know. My objectives are to review the normal imaging anatomy of the posterior tibial tendon and spring ligament, review the old concepts of posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, demonstrate cases, and introduce a newer concept of progressive collapsing flat foot deformity. Finally, I'm going to focus on what it is the surgeon wants to know. A basic review of the anatomy, first in the axial plane, from uh, medial to lateral in the flexor compartment, we see the posterior tibial tendon, the adjacent flexor digitorum longus tendon, the tibial neurovascular bundle, and the flexor hallucis longus tendon. Now I'll be scrolling anteriorly in the coronal plane, highlighting the posterior tibialis in yellow and the deltoid and spring ligament in blue. Notice that the posterior tibial tendon uh, remains superficial to the deltoid and spring ligament. We're now transitioning from the deep to the superficial deltoid. Um, we're moving uh, into the anterior components of the superficial deltoid, and here is a transition zone between the uh, uh, superficial deltoid ligament complex and the uh, spring ligament, which is located deep to the posterior tibialis. Now, rewinding again, in the oblique axial plane starting at the ankle. We see the deep deltoid ligament deep to the posterior tibial tendon. Now more anteriorly we're into the anterior superficial deltoid ligament and as we uh, move progressively anteriorly and inferiorly um, approaching the uh, uh, navicular insertion of the posterior tibialis we see the additional plantar slips of the spring ligament and finally the posterior tibial uh, insertion onto the medial pole navicular. The spring ligament is otherwise known as the calcaneonavicular ligament. There are three components. In red I've highlighted the supromedial and in blue the medial plantar oblique also referred to as the inframedial component and in green the inframplantar longitudinal component. We can see that this forms in the coronal plane. It forms a contiguous sling under the Taylor head. Now, at the plantar aspect of the uh, hind and midfoot, we see the inframedial uh, spring ligament and the uh, inferior plantar longitudinal component of the spring ligament. Again, in the coronal plane, we see this forms a sling under the Taylor head uh, and is interposed between the Taylor head and posterior tibialis. The posterior tibial tendon is the main dynamic stabilizer of the medial longitudinal arch. I'm going to highlight that in red all the way to the uh, main insertion onto the medial pole navicular. In the sagittal image um, in this uh, normal foot, we see a line drawn through the long axis of the talus intersects, uh, ultimately, if it were to be continued, the long axis of the first metatarsal. This is someone who has a preserved medial longitudinal arch. Now I've highlighted in blue in the central image the supromedial component and to the right the uh, medial plantar oblique component of the spring ligament. Notice in that central image that the supromedial spring ligament is located between the deep surface of the posterior tibial tendon and the medial tailor head. So the story we've been told about posterior tibial tendon dysfunction is that it results from chronic degenerative posterior tibial tendinosis. Clinically, there's pain and swelling along the course of the posterior tibialis, and ultimately, uh, typically in one to one and a half years, there'll be formation of uh, interstitial degenerative tearing of the posterior tibial tendon um, with uh, acquired flexible flat foot, possibly followed by rigid flat foot deformity. In this sagittal image, notice how the long axis of the talus um, now falls plantar to the midfoot, and if you continue it, uh, plantar to the first metatarsal in this person with flat foot deformity. Um, clinically, in these patients, we, we see not only flat foot deformity, but we also see hind foot valgus and forefoot abduction. Um, back in 1989, Dr. Johnson and colleagues um, laid out a schema for uh, classifying posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And it was stratified uh, from stage one to stage three by the uh, status of the uh, posterior tibial tendon. Uh, 
um, whether or not it was simply degenerative uh, with the peritendinitis or whether there was uh, interstitial or partial tearing um, with, uh, with flexible flat foot or uh, complete tearing uh, with rigid flat foot deformity. So it's not all about the posterior tibial tendon. Uh, in the context of posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, as it was called, the surgeons would often find that the tendon was degenerative but not torn, and they'd end up debrading the tendon without repair or tendon transfer. So uh, they switched to the term acquired flat foot deformity. And uh, it was known that posterior tibial tendon uh, was associated with acquired flat foot deformity as it increased stress on the static stabilizers of the arch, most notably the spring and superficial deltoid complex. So to review, the spring ligament includes that superomedial, medial plantar oblique, and infraplantar components, and the anterior superficial deltoid includes the tibionavicular and tibiospring components, which together uh, with the spring ligament forms a contiguous uh, sling from the uh, medial tibia to the uh, calcaneus and uh, through to the navicular. In 2005, Dr. DeLand and colleagues looked at 31 patients um, with MRI uh, um, affected with uh, acquired flat foot. They found that 100% of cases had a torn uh, supromedial spring ligament. Most had a torn superficial deltoid ligament. Uh, almost as many uh, had tears to the inframedial spring ligament, and there was a high percentage of talocalcaneal interosseous ligament tears. We haven't mentioned that structure. It's a ligament that lives within the deep posterior aspect uh, uh, of the uh, sinus tarsi, and in the coronal schema, you can see that it's a double banded ligament. Again, you see the uh, uh, deltoid spring ligament complex. Uh, interposed between the tailor head and posterior tibial tendon. So the first case I'll demonstrate is a 75-year-old man with acquired flat foot. There's fluid in an empty posterior tibial tendon sheath, so it's completely torn, and in the foot we see the distal stump of the torn tendon. In the coronal plane we see the tibial spring ligament, the distal stump of the torn posterior tibial tendon, and we don't see uh, the uh, torn supromedial spring ligament, which uh, should live uh, there, indicated by the arrow. Notice that the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament is intact. The second case is a 55-year-old woman with two months pain and swelling and an acquired flat foot deformity, so clinically she was suspected of having a posterior tibial tendon rupture. Fortuitously, in the sagittal plane, we see nearly the full length of the posterior tibial tendon from the ankle to its navicular insertion, and it is intact. Granted, it's uh, somewhat thick and superficially frayed with mild uh, peritendinous uh, uh, soft tissue thickening and edema. Notice that between the deep surface of the posterior tibial tendon and the medial tailor head, we don't see the superior medial spring ligament. So. It's torn. In the coronal plane, we see this uh, waviness or laxity of the tibiospring ligament, which is supposed to insert onto that torn superomedial spring ligament. We see thickening uh, and fraying of the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament. And notice edema in the uh, lateral tailor process and uh, calcaneus at what's really the anterior margin of the posterior subtalar joint, the surgeons describe this as a sign of sinus tarsi impingement. And in fact, we see reactive soft tissue uh, thickening and edema obscuring the normal fat planes in the sinus tarsi. Uh, my friend, Dr. Kai O'Neary, explained to me that the surgeons describe the sinus tarsi as the eye of the foot. It has a high percentage of corpuscular structures which uh, detect pain, temperature, and proprioception. In addition to that, with sinus tarsi syndrome, uh, individuals lose the ability to walk on uneven surfaces. The final case I'll illustrate is a 58-year-old man with symptomatic acquired flat foot deformity and calcaneofibular impingement. In this case, we see a thickening of the posterior tibial tendon with a partial split of the uh, tendon uh, and tenosynovitis. In the oblique axial plane, we see um, 
gross deformity of the thickened posterior tibial tendon with that partial split type tear. More posteriorly, there's lateral subluxation of the calcaneus under the talus. We don't see the superior spring ligament because it's torn. And there's marked attenuation of the talocalcaneal anterosseous ligament. Again, we see sinus tarsi impingement. And as we know, in this person with calcaneofibular impingement, there's marked narrowing of the interval between the deep surface of the fibula and the lateral calcaneal body. In 2002, Malachy and colleagues uh, used simulated weight-bearing CT in patients with symptomatic adult-acquired flat foot, and they showed that you could demonstrate direct visualization of sinus tarsi impingement, which was uh, present in the majority of cases. And subfibular impingement, actually, they showed narrowing of that interval in 66% of uh, patients, though bone-on-bone uh, -bone impingement was present in 19%. Uh, um, the take-home is that 100% of uh, patients with subfibular impingement have sinus tarsi impingement, but not vice versa. So subfibular impingement is considered end-stage. Uh, Dr. Cesar Neto uh, used weight-bearing cone beam CT to calculate um, surface uh, contact uh, between the articular surfaces of the posterior and anterior and middle subtalar sub facets. In the control, uh, there's uh, over 90% uh, congruence at the posterior and anterior and middle facets, but with acquired flat foot, there's a greater degree of uh, um, loss of contact at the anterior and middle compared to the posterior facets, meaning that there's a rotatory component of acquired uh, flat foot deformity. And in fact, acquired flat foot is a gross oversimplification. We can see in this um, animated schematic that there's uh, not only flat foot, but there's uh, hind foot valgus, there's um, forefoot abduction, and in fact, it's really uh, best described as peritalar subluxation. Essentially, the whole foot dislocates under the talus. Um, using cone beam uh, weight-bearing CT, it's been found that um, uh, developmental valgus angulation at the posterior subtalar facet of greater than 17 degrees is a risk factor for this progressive deformity. We already discussed that subluxation is greater at the middle and anterior compared to the posterior uh, facets of the subtalar joint. That sinus tarsi impingement we discussed actually limits the degree of uh, foot inversion, and that's when you uh, start uh, uh, seeing subluxation of the midfoot, eventually uh, with forefoot abduction and supination. So sinus tarsi impingement is considered a red flag, and subfibular impingement is really an end stage. So the term posterior tibial tendon dysfunction has to go, because posterior tibial tendon is not the primary problem. It's really more appropriately um, lesions of the uh, static stabilizers, namely the uh, supromedial primarily of the spring ligament complex, the superficial deltoid ligament, the anterior components, tibionavicular and uh, uh, tibiospring ligaments, as well as the talocalcaneal anterosseous ligament. Of course, there are other associated lesions, but these are uh, the, the main culprits. Not all flat foot is in adults, nor is it acquired, so uh, there's a problem with that term. And ultimately, uh, by consensus, it's been decided to use the term progressive collapsing foot deformity. And uh, as you'll see, um, flat foot is only one of five components in this progressive co collapsing foot deformity. Um, the uh, surgical consensus group met in uh, 2019 and published uh, their consensus in 2019. And they uh, described the deformity uh, at, um, in different classes according to the uh, location and type of deformity and, uh, and uh, detailed the associated clinical and radiographic findings. You'll notice that it's only class C that is uh, directly resulting from posterior tibial um, tendon pathology. In uh, 2019, Dr. Uh, Henry um, uh, uh, outlined a uh, uh, a nasty feedback loop of uh, uh, 
uh, acquired foot pathology that results in the context of posterior tibial tendon insufficiency with hind foot valgus, ultimately uh, provoking gastroc soleus shortening, peroneus brevis overpull, uh, leading to increased stress uh, on the subtalar joint and talocalcaneal ligament. Um, increased stress on the tarsal joints with ultimate forefoot abduction and supination, stress on the spring ligament, leading to medial arch collapse and further exacerbating strain on the tarsal joints, deltoid ligament strain, ultimately contributing to ankle instability and tailor tilt. But uh, uh, you'll notice that the posterior tibial tendon and spring ligament failure are only a part of this uh, progressive collapsing foot deformity. Uh, using uh, weight-bearing uh, comb beam CT and MRI, Dr. Uh, uh, Cesar Neto uh, looked at the various deformities and uh, which were the uh, primary structures that were torn. Um, and you can see that um, the spring ligament uh, is uh, primarily responsible for that medial uh, column collapse, um, whereas uh, the posterior tibial tendon uh, contributes to hind foot valgus and sinus tarsi impingement. There are many different ways that uh, we use uh, weight-bearing radiographs to quantify uh, acquired flat foot, but um, there can be a great deal of variability in those measurements. Um, with weight-bearing cone beam CT, um, not only are you um, um, acquiring the measurements under uh, true uh, normal weight-bearing conditions, but the uh, landmarks are precise and reproducible. Um, this is a very useful tool for evaluating uh, a progressive collapsing foot deformity. Um, you can directly see sinus tarsi impingement. You can measure that valgus inclination at the posterior subtalar facet and uh, detect and quantify subtalar uh, subluxation uh, and subfibular impingement. So finally, um, it should be noted that uh, different surgeons take different surgical approaches to uh, progressive collapsing foot deformity. Some emphasize posterior tibial tendon debridement with flexor tendon transfer and reconstruction of the spring and deltoid ligament complex, whereas others emphasize corrective osteotomy with or without arthrodesis. This mostly includes medializing calcaneal osteotomy, a plantar flexion uh, um, osteotomy of the medial cuneiform, and uh, first tarsal metatarsal osteotomy with fusion. It should be noted that arthrodesis is uh, used as a last resort as it's associated with worse outcomes. So uh, regardless of their approach, though, they want to know uh, what uh, the status of the posterior tibial tendon is. Also, the status of the uh, spring ligament complex, uh, primarily the superior medial and inframedial spring ligament, the um, superficial anterior components of the delt deltoid ligament complex, the talocalcaneal interosseous ligament. They want to know if we see signs of sinus tarsi impingement or of subfibular impingement, and ultimately if there's end stage secondary degenerative arthrosis. Finally, these are the surgeons who uh, gave me uh, quite an education on the topic of progressive collapsing foot deformity, Dr. Kayo Neri and Cesar de Cesar Neto. I could not have prepared this lecture without them, so I am grateful to them. Thank you.